Good morning. morning. Welcome to Midway United Methodist Church. I am Amanda Lane. I'm one of the pastors here. A few quick reminders about what's going on in the life of the church. Um, If you look at the back of your bulletin, there is a QR code. You can scan that with your, uh, your smartphone, and it will take you to our What's Happening page, which talks about everything that's going on in the life of the church. Um, At that page, you can also register your attendance. You can also register your attendance by tearing out this little flap in your bulletin, place that in the offering plate as it goes by. We want to uh, tell you all, thank you so much for serving with Family Promise this past week. Um, Everything came together and it was beautiful to see the families here. Um, enjoying food and fellowship and time together. We also have, um, we would like to invite you this morning to pray for Vacation Bible School. Uh, Tomorrow, we begin a weeks-long Vacation Bible School of Hero Hotline, and we'll have over 300 children, youth, and adults here to learn about Jesus. So, please, 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 Keep them in your prayers this week. We also want to welcome back Pastor Jenny. She's returned to us from family leave, and there's a drop-in reception in the gathering area, the bell tower entrance, immediately after this service. I'd encourage you to head over there, um, grab some good food, and tell Welcome Jenny back. So now let us open our hearts and our minds to the worship of God. If you would find your hymnal and stand as you're able as we open today with number 147, All Things Bright and Beautiful. bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, God made their glowing colors and made their tiny If you would now join me in our invitation confession in pardon, that can be found on the insert in your bulletin. Christ our Lord invites to his table 
all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Gracious God, we confess our sin, which separates us from you. We know how people who belong to you should live, but we fail to live that way. At times, we have forgotten that we bear your image and have done evil things. At times, we have forgotten to live in response to your sacrifice for us and have acted selfishly. At times, we have ignored the voice of your spirit speaking to our conscience, and we have followed the desires of our own hearts. As a result, we have lived for self rather than for you, our, our neighbor. Our lives have been diminished, our witness has been stifled, and your image within us have been tarnished. Forgive us, good Lord, through Jesus Christ. By your spirit, guide us to live as people who know and love you. The Lord who saves you says, I am the God who forgives your sins. I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. Let us praise the triune God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you for your investment in the mission and ministry of Jesus through our church, through Midway United Methodist Church. It's such a, it's such a privilege. It's such a, an honor to, just to be able to participate with God doing great work in the world, isn't it? So uh, I'd like to, to once again uh, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for uh, your service, for your time. And uh, right now, uh, we'd like to invite you to respond in worship with your giving. Um, again, because it's, it's, it's also important that we, uh, we respond to God in worship with our, with our resources, with our time and everything. So um, uh, here at Midway, we have three ways to give. The first one is uh, through, um, through our website and through our, our app. The second way is uh, you can mail a check to us, uh, to the church. And also, you can uh, just put your envelopes with your tithes and offerings in one of the offering plates. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are faithful. You are faithful to us. And because you are faithful and you are such a wonderful God, we want to respond to you with our tithes and offerings, Lord. We, we want to respond to you and worship you just giving back. In blessing our community, blessing our church, blessing the world, just in the same way you have blessed us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because you are good. In your name we pray. Amen.
Won't you sing with me? There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for another another beautiful day, uh, a day that we can truly feel your presence your holy spirit in our lives we can see your face shining lord in our lives lord we thank you for your faithfulness we thank you for your your goodness for your grace and for your power lord we we ask for your mercy as we have fell short many times we have not fulfilled your call or lived up for your plans for us Lord so we we pray for forgiveness Lord we thank you because you not only sent your son Jesus Christ to die for us but you've given us a mission you've given us a, a purpose you've given us a a great commission that is to go and make disciples so today Lord as we continue learning from you what it is and what it means to go and make disciples Lord that you uh, your Holy Spirit touch us in a way that we we feel compelled we feel, Lord, or we understand once and for all that our, our mission in life, our purpose in life is to go and make your name famous and guide people through understanding what it is to honor and glorify your name, living purpose. Lord, and we pray this as we pray. The prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I stand before you this morning uh, suffering. Suffering from an embarrassment of riches of love. 
that I have received from you over the last five months during my mother's illness and passing. I, I cannot express adequately um, how um, much your prayers and your cards, your texts, food, everything uh, that you've done to uh, reach out and to love my family and, and me. I want to thank Stephen um, for serving so enthusiastically as the interim pastor. And um, I want to thank the staff for each had to do more than their share, but especially express my gratitude to Amanda, who's been serving as both senior and associate. Especially over this last month, um, where she is carrying the full load. And, um, um, you know, when we were looking for an associate, my charge was to find someone who things could go on just as usual if I wasn't here. And so we know that we have that person. So thank you, Amanda. Our lesson today is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, uh, verses 16 through 20. Um, these are the last words the resurrected Jesus spoke to the disciples, and these are the concluding words of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, this passage is one of the lessons on this Trinity Sunday. It's it's chosen because it contains one of the few places in the New Testament that has the Trinitarian language of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you might be relieved to know that this morning I'm not going to try to explain the Trinity to you. Um, I won't be offering any inadequate metaphors uh, that inevitably falls short of the great mystery of God, three in one. You know, so a lesson like that is better tackled in a study rather than a short sermon. Oh, as significant as the Trinitarian language is in this passage, what lies at the heart of it is the Great Commission. Last words are important, right? Very important. And in these Jesus' last words to his disciples, he gives them a mission. Hear now God's word to us this day. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. To the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Summer has begun and I'm sure many of you are now counting down the days to a much anticipated summer vacation. When you go on vacation, where do you like to go? You know, it's often said that there are two kinds of people. There are beach people and there are mountain people. Do you, raise your hands. Who of you likes to go to the beach? Okay. Who of you prefers the mountains? Okay. It, that depends on the year. Probably the season, too. Well, you know, one of the things I love about living is to in the peach state is that we have the best of both worlds. We can either be in the mountains or on the beach in less than a tank of gas. Naturally, we choose to vacation in that locale that best soothes our bodies and our souls, that place where we can sit back, 
relax, smell the flowers or the ocean air, take in the beauty of God's creation and reconnect with loved ones. If anyone was deserving of a vacation, it, it was the disciples. On the heels of all that had happened that week, they were sorely in need of a little R&R. They needed some time away to grieve, to decompress, to try to make sense of all that had transpired over the week from Jesus' arrest to his crucifixion and now reports of his resurrection. So the disciples head to the mountains, or more accurately, to a specific unnamed mountain in Galilee. They didn't go there, though, to vacation. They went there because they were following Jesus' directions passed on to them from the two Marys. You see, according to Matthew's account of the resurrection, none of the disciples have yet to see the risen Jesus. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are the only followers who up to this point have encountered Jesus outside the tomb. And it is to them that Jesus delivers the charge that his disciples were to go ahead of him to Galilee, to a mountain that he would show them. So based on the word of the women, if you can believe it or not, the disciples travel some 60 to 80 miles from Jerusalem back to Galilee, back to where it all began, back to where Jesus first called his disciples, and back to where he preached his very first sermon, which, lest we forget, was on a mountain, the famous ser Sermon on the Mount. Everything, it seems, has come full circle. There are 11 of them on that mountain. 11, not 12. Their community has been broken by betrayal and death. Judas is no longer counted among them. He is no longer among the living. Eleven. It's, it's more than a number. It's a reminder that the community to which Jesus appears is broken and far from perfect. It's a community desperately in need of Jesus' healing presence. If there is any doubt as to the flawed nature of this community of disciples, Matthew underscores it again when he reports the 11th reaction to Jesus' appearance. They worshipped him, but some doubted. Actually, what it literally says is they worshipped him and they doubted. It wasn't that some of them had a rock-solid faith and some of them didn't. It's that within each of them was a mixture of passionate throw-themselves-at-Jesus-feet worship coupled with a lingering, nagging doubt. So... Don't beat yourselves up if there is within you such a mixture. If even those who saw the risen Christ with their own eyes were conflicted, I don't think we should be too hard on ourselves. If Jesus doesn't chide his followers for their doubts, neither should we. For it is into the hands of these doubting Thomases that Jesus entrusts the future of his church with his commission. Therefore, go. What does the therefore refer to? It refers to Jesus' authority. It is by his authority that the disciples are sent out to make other disciples. The disciples' mission then is authorized and undergirded by Jesus' authority. 
It stands on Jesus' authority alone, not the disciples' authority. This is good news because the mission is not dependent upon the wavering faith of Jesus' followers. It's not by our own steam that we carry out this mission passed down to us. It's by the authority of the risen Christ, the one who has the power to forgive sin, to heal the sick, to make the wounded whole, and to call the dead to life, the one who can change hearts and transform lives from the inside out. It's by that authority. Therefore, go. You know, much is often made of the go in the Great Commission. Some have taken the word so literally that they have packed up their bags and gone to faraway lands and cultures to spread the gospel. They are to be honored for their faithfulness and for the sacrifices they have made to be faithful to God's call in their lives. The go here, though, is not a direct command. It's more when you go or as you go. The going, you see, is assumed. After all, the disciples can't remain on that mountain forever, can they? At some point, they have to go back down. They just can't hold up in their sanctuary forever. The mountain, you see, is no place for a staycation, and neither is this chapel. Sooner or later, we have to leave the security and comfort of this community and head back into the world, a world teeming with people who, who know nothing about Jesus and are desperate to know that there is a living God who created them and loves them. Therefore, go. Go where? To all nations. The mission is no longer solely to the house of Israel, no longer only to the Jews, but to all peoples. It's not about geography necessarily, about literal countries, but about the need for the gospel to be shared with everyone so that all may know the love and grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Surely this all must have taken the disciples back because this was a change. The mission had been only to the house of Israel. Now it's to all. Jesus, you don't really mean all, do you? Because all would include, you know, people we don't like or people we disagree with or people whose political views and lifestyles are different from ours. Include even those people who mock our faith. Jesus says all. And all means all, y'all. All means all. Everyone, especially those outside the community to whom Matthew wrote. That is, everyone beyond the community that was known as the church. Our mission as a United Methodist congregation comes from the Great Com Commission. Our stated mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for what? for the transformation of the world. I think it would be more accurate to say that over the last several years, we have been making dissension more than making disciples. As Methodists, we are a broken and splintered group. It's disheartening and quite frankly, exhausting. I cannot adequately express to you how sick and tired I am of church politics, lawsuits, and stone throwing from all sides. 
enough already. We have been given a mission. We must get beyond the distractions of votes and disagreement and get back to business, focusing on our mission, the clear mission that Jesus delivered on a mountain to Galilee, the mission of making disciples. Amen? Amen. So how are we to make disciples? According to Jesus, by doing just two things, baptizing and teaching. Why baptize? Why, why is baptism important? Isn't it enough for people to believe? Well, let me put it this way. Why get married? After all, it's just a piece of paper, right? That's what folks say. They're wrong, though. For when a couple stands before God and loved ones and make a commitment to each other, they're saying, I'm in this all the way, through thick and thin and sickness and in health until death. Not, I'm in this until the lease runs out. It's no more just a piece of paper than that water and that font is just water. It's called a covenant. There's a man, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a man in our church who's been coming to Midway for decades. And unbeknownst to me, he'd never been baptized. He came to us and said, I want to be baptized. He's been going to church his whole life. Why bother with baptism now? Because he wants to declare his faith publicly and be counted among the followers of Jesus. He wants to be in covenant with God and God's people. You think that liquid in that bowl is just water to him? Over the last few months, as I cleaned out my parents' condo, I became friends with their neighbors, wonderful people, most of whom are devoted Christians who demonstrated it by their love. Well, they hold a weekly women's Bible study there in the retirement community's clubhouse. And they had their last session of the their spring study a couple of weeks ago. And as they were finishing up the study, the leader of the group told me that one of the ladies spoke up and, and she said, before we end, I need to share something. I've never been baptized. I want to be baptized. And she said it with tears in her eyes. So what'd you do, I asked the lady who related the incident to me. We baptized her <laughs> right then and there. I'll admit, I was taken aback. My internal reaction was, what? With no ordained minister, no consecrated church, no instruction about the meaning of the sacrament, you know, all kinds of theological alarm bells started going off in my head. And then I thought about these disciples whom Jesus sent down that mountain on a great mission. When those apostles started out, they didn't have any church buildings with fancy fonts and baptismal pools. They were on the go. And they baptized people on the spot right where they were. Make disciples. Isn't that what that Bible study group was doing? Maybe they baptized that woman by Jesus' authority. Who am I to say? Jesus said we are to make disciples by baptizing. He also said we are to make disciples by teaching. The disciples, the students, are now to become teachers. That doesn't mean that they stop learning. It means that they are to start teaching what they have learned. 
Notice Jesus didn't say teach and then baptize. He didn't say. He said baptize and teach. You know, some people think that once they're baptized, that's it. They've got their insurance card for heaven. They're good to go. Their name is in the book. But baptism is when the real learning begins, when the long apprenticeship of following Jesus to become more like him starts, which is what a disciple is, someone who is following Jesus to become more like Jesus. Notice also that Jesus doesn't highlight a particular command that the disciples are to teach obedience to. Everything that is what the word Jesus uses, everything that Jesus commanded would certainly include what? The great commandment, right? To love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. Surely it would include the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, come to think about it, learning to live by just these commands would be enough to keep us busy until Jesus came again. But I think what Jesus had in mind was not teaching people a bunch of rules to obey, but for people to be made disciples by internalizing the whole body of Jesus' teachings, which requires, of course, that we ourselves know the scriptures and what he taught in order to teach it to others. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is on the road going where an angel of the Lord directed him when he saw a man. The man was an Ethiopian eunuch, and he was reading the Hebrew scriptures. Philip asked the man if he understood what he was reading, and, and you know what that man said? How can I unless someone explains it to me? So Philip, he he jumped up and hitched a ride with the man and his chariot. And beginning with what the man was reading, he explained the scriptures to him and told him the good news about Jesus. They came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, look, here's some water. What, What can stand in the way of my being baptized? So they both went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Philip made a disciple, and he did it as he was going. He taught the man, and he baptized him. It was as simple as that. And because he and the other apostles were obedient to the Great Commission, And that endless line of splendor after them. You and I are here this morning. Today, my brothers and sisters, Jesus comes to meet us at this table. Just as he met those disciples on that mountaintop in Galilee. It's one of the ways that he assures us that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. The question is, when we leave this sanctuary, will we take a vacation from our faith until next Sunday? Or will we go and make disciples? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you now join me on page 13 for our liturgy for communion this morning?
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This morning we will receive the, uh, the elements. All of our elements are gluten-free. As you come forward, be reminded that all are welcome. You do not have to be a member of this church to participate in communion. All you need to do is be willing to receive the grace of God. The ushers will direct you forward to receive communion. And please let an usher know if you would like to receive communion in your seats. And we will make sure that we bring that communion to you. Would those who are assisting with communion come forward at this time?
Amen. And if you would find your hymnal and turn to number 571, stand with me as you're able as we close today with Go Make of All Disciples. Remember, we have Vacation Bible School this week, and please be in prayer for the children as well as all the volunteers. Also, we ask you to pray for Tiffany. I almost forgot to mention as she's, she's sick, and she very much needs our prayers, and we need her leadership too. So. Now may God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to direct you. May God go beside you to befriend you. May God rest above you to protect you. May God rest below you to uphold you. And may God dwell within you to comfort you as you go and make disciples. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.